Welcome to the Elevate Media Podcast with your host, Chris Anderson. In this show, Chris and his guests will share their knowledge and experience on how to go from zero to successful entrepreneur. They have built their businesses from scratch and are now ready to give back to those who are just starting. Let's get ready to learn, grow, and elevate our businesses. And now your host, Chris Anderson. Welcome back to another recording of the Elevate Media Podcast. I am Chris Anderson, your host. And today we're going to dive into a topic which has been on my mind and will probably happen in the future, and that is writing a book. And writing a book can seem daunting and overwhelming and very time-consuming, but we're going to talk to an expert today uh, about how to get it done and, and maybe some ways that we can do it in a quicker fashion and still be successful. So uh, today I've got Mike Ulmer on the show today. Mike, welcome to the LV Media Podcast. Chris, thank you for having me. It's a treat to be down there in Indiana. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to have you on. Uh, definitely looking forward to you know picking your brain and uh, asking some questions around becoming an author and what's that like? Because you've authored multiple books. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I guess yeah. I'm coming up on 20. That I <laughs> to say, just a few. <laughs> that I've either written myself. Most of them I've written myself. Some I've written with other people. And a couple of them towards the end, I sort of worked with them um, with clients of ours. So I say 20, but you know, it could be more, it could be less. After a while, it's, it seems a little... Uh, and gracious to, to count. <laughs> right. But that's, that's fantastic. Some people, you know, never write one and, you know, it's always on their bucket list, you know, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, but so what got you into being an author? I know you've had an extensive career, you know, as an interviewer, as a writer for sports. So yeah. what is that kind of the transition that got you into actually being an author of, of books? Sorry, you know, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell this story because authoring, being an author is something people, re- a lot of people aspire to, right? Mm-hmm. And they say, well, how did you get this? And I say, I'm always embarrassed because basically just someone came to me and asked me to do it. <laughs> and so I didn't have to, to hunt for an agent and I didn't have to do all that stuff. Someone was looking for a book done and I, at the time I was working for a publication called The Hockey News. And they wanted a hockey book and they called the editor of The Hockey News and they said, you know, we, we need a book. And you got anybody? And they referred them to me and that was my first book. And and then uh, one kind of, yeah, as they say, one thing sort of led to another. But I always had access to interesting people because of my journalism, because I, mm-hmm. I was journalism at the same time. So I'd be writing, you know, books for kids and books for, for hockey, but also journalism and, and other endeavors. So after a while, you get enough interviews, you kind of almost do it by 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 habit. But writing a book is a, a guy said to me one time when I was just writing my first book, he said, you know, you're going to be walking down the street and you're going to look over and you're going to see there's a, a person reading a book on a bus and you're going to find yourself jumping up and down to see if they're reading your book. <laughs> it's, it's that much fun. Yeah. And it really is. It's, it's, it's the greatest experience. I tell people that the experience of writing the book is what you're paying me for. I'll throw the book in for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because some... The clarity and the stuff that comes with writing the book is, is remarkable. Yeah. And with that, like, did you have any, you know, someone obviously, like you said, someone came, she said, hey, write this book, or you need to write this book. Did you have any, you know, drag your feet moments, any moments of like, do I really need it? Like, should I do this? Or is anyone ever actually going to read this? You know, like the normal kind of limiting beliefs a lot of people have before they write a book. Did you have any of that? No, I didn't because I was okay. writing with somebody else because I, I was, so I was okay. writing about uh, players for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I knew people would read it, but a little while later, um, the same publisher came to us and they said, uh, came to me and they said, we'd like you to do a book on Canada. It'd be an alphabet book. And it was more like what you're talking about. There really mm-hmm. isn't any guaranteed return from it. And they said, do an alphabet book on Canada. And I said, no, I don't want to. <laughs> and they came back and they said, come on, do it out. Nah, I don't want to do that. So they said, come on down to our headquarters. It was in Chelsea, Michigan, where Jeff Daniels is from. Mm. I came down there and they gave me lunch. And when you give me lunch, I'm a lot more amenable. So, so they had to do the book. That book was the smartest thing I ever did because it sold like 160,000 copies. Wow. And it's in every elementary school, every, every library here in, in Canada. It's called Emma's for Maple. Uh-huh. People, when they have a, a, when you have family, Canadian family uh, overseas or somewhere living in the U.S. or you're living in a different country, they ask me to sign it and we send it to them. And it's just been the greatest thing. My kids will always go into a library where they know that they can find a book of their dad's. Huh. And I was going to turn that down. That's really cool. That is yeah. that is a neat thing. Now, now I'm curious with it, and you, obviously you don't have to divulge any of this information, but when you do something like that, obviously it's not a book about you specifically as a person. It's not uh, about your business specifically. 
do you have some sort of residuals that come from books like that yeah, that you when, get? Yeah, when it's always a little, it's twenty years later. Every couple of times a year, they drop a little coin in the in my purse, and it's <laughs> okay. Uh, it's lovely, but you know, it's funny because that's really a great question because every book that you do is really about you. Okay. Yeah. Even if you're writing about somebody else, you're writing about you because you're the prism that it's, that that story mm. is is flowing towards your understanding of the subject and your worldview. It's impossible to not write a book about you, even when you're okay. writing a book about somebody or something else. That's why writing a book, that's one of the great things about it is that you have to imbue it with your sensibilities, your understandings, your conclusions. And when you do that, you go, oh, I never saw that. Oh, yeah. yeah. So even if you're doing a book on real estate, right, you're, you're, you're doing a, really a book about something that you're obviously you're interested, in, but you're, you're, you're reaching new conclusions about the subject all the time. So if you can imagine taking that process and then doing it for yourself and your mm-hmm. own career and your own life, if you could write a book just about real estate and never having done real estate, imagine what you can do when you're writing a book about real estate, having always been a real estate guy. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Cause we definitely bring our own, you know, perspectives and, and thought processes within that, even if it's not about us directly. So that's a great thought. And, you know, with it, a lot of people, we the listen to the show or trying to build, you know, their business, their brand online mm-hmm. with, with book writing. And I've wondered this and I'm, I'm assuming that there's a place in time to write one kind of about your journey, um, about, you know, the path you've come through. You, you want to wait on something like that, right? To, to once you've reached a certain level of quote unquote success to be able to have more, I guess, weight well, behind yeah. it or. Well, Chris, I don't know that I'd say that. Okay. I think that, that I think every book has three real essential components. Okay. And yeah, you can't, I don't know that you can write a book when, about real estate when you're still in high school. Right. I, <laughs> I, I get what you're saying. You have to have a little experience, but the first thing in write is three. I think if you look at every great business book, if you look at, uh, the four hour work week is a great example. Mm-hmm. So the four hour work week has a great, great, what I call a proposition. It's generally the name of the book or it's a line about the book. And the four hour work week says, why are you working 60 hours and hating your job? Why not work four hours, do it differently and love it. Now who could not want to read that? I mean, <laughs> right. everyone would want to read that. That's a proposition. And, mm. and every book has a different proposition. The latest book out is called quit. Really great. Really a big bestseller in business. It's about, it asks this question. It says, and I'll ask you, Chris, what's what's the goal of a summiteer? What's what's the goal? What are you trying to do? Uh, of a what? I, I didn't hear you. You're a summiteer, right? You you you, you climb summits. Yep. Okay. That's your, your thing. So when you approach a summit, what are you trying to do? Trying to get to the top and, and see what's out there. No, man. You're trying to get back home to the bottom. After you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And if you have to pick between the two, you want to pick getting home. Yeah. And so that book, really smart book, looks at the idea that sometimes quitting is the right thing to do, mm-hmm. right? If you if there's lots of bodies are strewn on many a mountain with people who had a schedule to decide to junk it and they put getting to the summit ahead of getting back home. Mm. Great proposition, right? Yeah. Great yeah. So if you're going to write that book, okay. The second thing is you don't have to be a summiteer to write the book. You just have to be sort of know a little bit of experience and about how the world works. So you have, but in your case, you have to have a background that led you to that conclusion. Mm-hmm. So let's say you weren't a summiteer, but you had a career in business and you stuck with a lot of jobs where you shouldn't have. And you stuck with a lot of relationships when you shouldn't have. And all you did was you were really narrowly focused on that goal. But then you realize that's not working for you. Sometimes you have to pivot. Sometimes you have to make a different move. Yeah. And you did this and you changed the marriage. You did this and you learned and you had mentors and you came to this conclusion about quitting. Mm-hmm. Sometimes quitting is the right thing to do. Okay, that's your backstory. When mm. the writer, the reader reads that, they know that you've walked miles to sort of get to that conclusion, right? They have confidence in your conclusion because of your backstory. If you had a backstory that was completely disassociated from that conclusion, it wouldn't have any relevance. But if you have a proposition, a great backstory, and the third thing you need is advice. Mm. If people are coming to you and they're reading your book, they want to know stuff. So give them tips and hacks and ideas and stuff like that and just fill up their basket with advice, you know, good advice. Those are the three elements of business book. Anyone can write them, but that blueprint, if you look at any, any business book from how to win friends and influence people to uh, uh, 50 uh, time management for morals to all sorts of different books, they all follow that same proposition. So anyone can do them. 
and they're fantastic to do. Yeah. And that's a great, great point. Cause I wonder with like the structure of writing a book, you know, I've heard like you have the hook and then you have like, and I'm going to get this wrong because I haven't done this, but you have the hook, you get them. That's a prop. That's a proposition. And, and then it builds on itself and you have that kind of the climax and then it kind of lets down to the conclusion. Is that kind of the same pathway you're talking about? Very much. Yeah. yeah. It's, you start to start, start with the conclusion mm. because you have to sort of engage the reader pretty quickly on as soon as you get the conclusion, then you slide into the backstory and you start yeah. talking about how you got there. And then you kind of slide into the tips. It's not like it's like 10,000 words, proposition, 10,000 words, backstory, 10,000 word tips. They sort of enmesh with each other, but th- that's certainly the formula because that's what people are looking for. They, yeah. they, they need to, they, they, you know, people often write stories, books, and think the story that the reader's interested in their story. The reader doesn't care about your story, Chris. They, yeah, right. they don't care less about the story. Yeah. Mom wouldn't read a book about me. Right. Right. Well, no one cares about your story. Everyone cares about your conclusions. Yeah. Right. That's what you want to hear. Your mm. conclusions. If you hear someone talking about a great stock tip as you're walking by, you kind of yep. you might tilt your ear a little bit to hear that. You put we value other people's conclusions. And so to do that, um uh you, you give the conclusion first and then you give the story that validates the conclusion. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, definitely makes sense. And it because people really just care about themselves and how can they get something from it basically. So. Oh, we're all the same, right? Yeah. We're, we're, I'm, I'm sure this, this joke is, uh, has been, uh, has been told in Kokomo and parts abroad, but you know, it's the one about the two hunters and they come around the corner and there's a great big bear there and the bear rears up and the one guy says, what do we do? And the other guy says, well, we run. The first guy says, well, you can't outrun a bear. You don't have to run. I don't have to run the bear. Just you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're built for that. That's how yeah. we're. That's good. So if people are trying, okay, so they've got the framework of understanding like how maybe they should structure writing the book. How can they overcome some hurdles and actually start? <laughs> because yeah, it can seem daunting, like, oh, I'm going to open this Google Doc or this World, Word document, blank canvas, and just start writing. Um, yeah, okay. Like, how can people overcome those kind of things? Well, I guess one of the things that this is kind of immodest, but they could come to me because mm-hmm. and I guess I'll, I'll make the plug here. That's kind of what I do. I sit yeah. with people and we work together and we find that, that those three things, what the proposition is, what your story is, and what you give, you bring to the party in terms of advice. And then we really work on giving you a blueprint. And then the thing that we do to sort of, now you have stuff, right? And then I'll, we'll give you the transcripts to your conversation. So now you're not looking at an empty page because that's really smart, Chris. Yeah. That is really, really daunting. That's yeah. the, the madness right there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Doing that. But um, it, with, with that, then they can get started. And we do it in 100 days. You can write 200 mm-hmm. words a day and have a 20,000 word book. Mm-hmm. And you don't need anything more than 20,000 words to have a great book because 95% of the part of having a book is having a book. Right. 5% is what's inside it. Mm-hmm. And that's really, really essential because you owe that to yourself and to the reader to make a great book. Yeah. But 95% of the impact of the book is not through its content, but through its existence. Hmm. The fact that you are confident enough and feel entitled enough to write about a subject tells something, tells the reader something. There's nobody else in your sector that's written a book because it's hard. Right? Right. And, and, and no one's done it. So when you're the only person telling the story, yours is the only story that counts. And when, you know, and in terms of your social media, it's a North star for your social media. You just come back to that proposition. You're that guy. You're that guy. Mm. I was talking to a potential client the other day, and he's in a situation where he's in a category completely dominated by another piece of software, right? He's, uh, we used to say he was uh, Avis to, uh, to Hertz number two. Uh, mm. Like he's the number two guy, and he's never going to be, he's never going to catch up that so- where that other software is. And that's the way things are. The, uh, mm. So Coke started like 115 years ago. Pepsi started 108 years ago. Pepsi's never caught up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 100 years later, they've never caught up. So, okay, so we're talking about that. And, and he has a great, his, his software has great utility. And he, but he's looking for a subject to do on a podcast on. And we sort of kicked it around. And he's got an interesting story, very interesting guy. So he said, what about a podcast for all the people who know they're never going to win the Super Bowl? Right? <laughs> 
they're never going to dominate that category. But if they move their market share up from five to 12%, they're going to have a retirement. Yeah. They're going to otherwise have, right? Yeah. That's a, that's a really compelling story. What, what are you going to do when you're not, when you, how do you behave? What do you do? How do you grow when you're not going to win the Super Bowl? Mm. The runners up, the runner right. ups. Right. Except that if you get to retire, when yeah. you come from the summit, you're not the runner up. You're right. the yeah, that's yeah, true. <laughs> that's good. So, yeah. So that's, that's kind of the gig. It's that, it's that finding those three things. And so, but to your point, um, I think the best way to do it is go at, I give myself, we all work better to deadlines. So mm-hmm. I'll give you a hundred days. And yeah. what I say is we're going to, we're going to work it all out. We're going to figure it all out. I'm going to give you this blueprint. And I'm going to give you every every word you gave me. So you're you're entering this with a map. You know where you want to go. You know where you want to get to. Here's what a couple of potential covers could look like. Here's 100 days. Call me whenever you want me. <laughs> whenever you want to talk to me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write it. But whenever you want to talk to me, and I'll, we'll go over your story so much, you'll be so sick of me. <laughs> <laughs> you you'll be praying for that 100 days to come just so you don't have to talk. <laughs> to me. But we'll get, we'll, we'll get it done. We'll find your stories and we'll do it in a hundred days. That's 200 days. Like a, a laundry list is a hundred words, right? Yeah, yeah. A grocery list is a hundred words. You can do 200 words a day. Yeah. Do it for a hundred days and that's 20,000 words. We can do that. Yeah. With that, you know, do you go self-editing or do you guys have editing or editors with you or, you know, could, because, you know, a lot of people, at least from, from where I sit, the big thing is, Amazon bestseller. It's the yeah. New York Times bestseller. Those lists, like, are those things no still prevalent? Do they even matter anymore? Are is it just kind of a pay pay to play type of platform now to get on those lists, or, or what is your perspective on those? I think they're they, I think they're false. Mm-hmm. I don't. Okay. When, I see a, when I see bestseller, I'm automatically dubious because it's it's uh you get all your friends to uh, to uh, first you, you choose a really obscure category. <laughs> And then you get all your friends to buy it, you know, or pre-order it, and you get a ranking based on that. You know, if you look on online, you've seen this as well as I have, Chris. There's lots of people who tell you you're going to have an Amazon bestseller as long as you market it with them. I don't worry about that shit at all. Just yeah. write a book. Just yep. write a good book, and it'll take care of itself because it'll it'll spread by word of mouth. No one buys or doesn't buy a book based on Amazon bestseller status. Yeah. And I think as we get more sophisticated and really understand what's being done here. You know, it's just a manipulation of the algorithm. I don't think I don't find it particularly honorable. I know people do it, but it's not something that I would recommend people do. Right? Not, good not focus, not focus on. But if it comes naturally through just having a great book, fantastic. Yeah, that's it. That's in that case, shout it from the mountaintops. Yeah, write a great book. Don't worry about the marketing. But you made a great point about the editing. So hmm. where I come in price wise, and I'm going back into the the sell thing part of it is is that. Ours is like six thousand bucks. Okay, we can't edit your book for that. But if you want right. to find editors, we can direct you to them. Or you know, there's Fiverr, there's Freelancer, there's different services that'll give that for you. So we either have a recommended one, or but it's really the price point that the client's interested in. If, mm-hmm. if they want to, you know, they want to edit themselves. That's the one thing, though. I would say two things. I would also add, Chris, is is hey, let me give you an example. Yeah. I talk to a lot of kids because M is, M is for maple. And one of the things I do is I do this. Hang on. Okay. And I ask the kids, if I get a bald spot, and the kids say, yeah. And I say, Come on, man. If I get a bald spot, and the kids say, yeah. I say, quit kidding around. If I get a bald spot by now, the kids are yelling. They're going, yeah. And then I turn them and I say, well, that's funny because when I brush my teeth, I don't see a bald spot. <laughs> we can't look at our own work and not see – well, you don't know what you don't know, right? Right. And so you, uh, you're you going to make mistakes because you spell the word the word you thought it was spelled, but it's not spelled that way. Mm-hmm. And spell check's going to catch it. Sometimes it will, and sometimes it won't. You really, really, really need someone who can who can copy edit for you and really um, – because every time you make a mistake, you lower your eyes uh, and the, uh, credibility in the eyes of the, the, the reader. And that's really hard because if they see three mistakes, man – but three mistakes, there's – there's 50, 100 facts on a page. Everything from how you spell it, Canadian to, you know, Australian <laughs> yeah. spelling or whatever, uh, to uh, to measurements, distance measurements, to um, a, a state where something happened, where something didn't happen. Maybe it was a Tuesday instead of a Wednesday. Maybe you should have, you, the verb is kind of slightly incorrect for this. That's not the perfect verb. There's 100 ways on, on one page that you can mess up. And mm-hmm. if you've got, if you find 99 of them, you still got 200 mistakes in your book. 
That's hard. That's yeah. really hard. And that's why you have to have the person who's, who's not looking at this, although there's not a whole lot there, <laughs> but who still sees that, who still knows what you don't know and can help you over that. That's mm. really that, important. What I do is point. give you the big ideas and remove all that stuff and figure out your base story. The other thing, Chris, now that I'm blathering, <laughs> the other thing I guess is that's so great of it is that if I, you and I talk and we talk about you folks and we talk about where you grew up and your experiences and, you know, who the important people you were, or maybe, you know, something in your career that nobody else knows something in, about your business that nobody else knows. That's super important. So this is kind of, if I may, this is an example. Yeah. Of sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's say you're doing a book. Let's say you're an estate planner in the U S and time after time, no one loves paying taxes, right? right? <laughs> so time after time after time, you come in and you get a client who's bent and bound not to pay an inheritance tax, and they'll move properties around. They'll have different beneficiaries. They'll say, yeah, tell them, give them this, but then tell them after I'm dead, they'll, they'll bring it back. And they'll they'll make an unholy mess of their estate <sighs> and destroy the family that they're supposed to be trying to help and protect and promote. Mm-hmm. Just in the name of not paying inheritance taxes, because no one likes paying inheritance taxes, right? Right. Give me, Chris, give me just a, I know this is a question out of the cold, but just give me a, a, a percentage of, of times out of 100 that you think somebody has to pay an inheritance tax. Like, let's say you have 100 deaths. How many of those have to pay an inheritance tax? You love listening to podcasts, but have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Maybe you want to build a brand, grow your business or are looking for an excuse to talk about your favorite hobby. Whatever your reason for making a podcast, Buzzsprout is the place to start. Since 2009, Buzzsprout has helped over 300,000 people launch their own podcasts. Buzzsprout walks you step-by-step through the whole process and will give you powerful tools to start, grow, and monetize your podcast. Ready to get started? Click the link in the show notes to get our free step-by-step guide to starting your podcast today. Um, let's, I'm going to go with 75. 0.5. <laughs> oh, that's way off. <laughs> <laughs> because we all think we're being taxed, right? Yeah. It's 0.05, less than 1%. Huh. Of, and you can look the, it's, that's an IRS number. You can look okay. it up. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, you know, so really what people do time after time after time, they're destroying their, their, their families for a tax. They're never going to have to pay. Hmm. They wouldn't have had to pay anyway. Well, if you're an estate planner and you write a book about that, right, don't destroy your family over, over a tax you're never going to have to pay. You can build your book all around that, that one fact. And then you yeah. talk about people after people after people in my office that want to you know, do all these crazy things. I can't talk them out of it. This family got ruined. That family got ruined. That mom's not talking to that daughter. If you have that one super powerful piece of truth, then you kind of owe it to people to share it with them. True. And that's kind of like what I do with, you know, talk to people about podcasting. I'm like, you have a story, you have an expertise, you have experiences to share and holding that inside. If you're not putting it out through your podcast, through being interviewed, like someone is missing out on that information that could help them on their journey. And so they're, yeah. So that's, it's super important. Like if you have something to share in some way um, and, and, you know, with that too, you know, talking about the editing and, and you, having people like yourself help people write the book, edit the book. What is your opinion? Because this just popped in my head yeah. of ghostwriters with well, think, books. We're sort of ghostwriters. I'm sort of a ghostwriter because we can do that. And we, okay. we have done that for, for people. A ghostwriter is a little different in that a ghostwriter, you say, uh, I'm going to hire Chris and uh, come back in three months with the book, Chris. And yeah. I might ask you this or that, or I might we might have an afternoon together. If I'm, I, I guess, I, I guess what, if a ghostwriter is someone who, who performs the book without putting their byline on, and there's just nothing wrong with that. The person wants, it's their ideas. And if they're willing to pay for it, that's absolutely fine. Mm-hmm. I think though, the problem with ghostwriters is they just sort of go to the internet and they go, here's your book. If yeah. I'm going to ghostwrite your book, you're going to hate me. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm going to want to get it right. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to come back to you a lot of times. Now it doesn't mean that it's a big hunk of time i, I ghostwrited it i did a, a book with a great entrepreneur named ron foxcroft and he invented those if you go to your nephew's 
you know, at sporting events, he admitted the whistle like, is really, really, really high and really, really, really shrill. He has a great story, great guy. Huh. And, he it, and he gave me about eight hours. But, you know, you talk to someone over 15 minute increments, you know, or 40 minutes, it's the odd one hour increment, eight hours, a lot of time to spend with me. <laughs> yeah, right. So the, the good side is you get a book with only eight hours talking to someone like me. The bad side is you, you still have to spend the eight hours talking to someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that makes sense. It, it, I guess when you're, if you're looking for a ghostwriter, like seeing how their process goes, like, are they going to actually dive in more and spend more time to get that? Or are they just going to say, Oh, these are three points. Okay, boom, and kind of go. I think that would kind of separate. Maybe depending on the book you want, a good ghostwriter from you know just one who's trying to write. Well, I mean, AI is going to have a profound impact on that, don't you think? In terms yeah. of, of of ghostwriting, because now they can it, it can take all that information and form it in some in a fairly coherent manner. And for some people, that'll be enough. Yeah, it's true. It's it's going to be an interesting thing how AI. Um, it's already shifted things, but how it continues to, especially in the writing industry and but I still find I think AI's got a little a little ways to go to make it sound human, you know, have that um, because we've we've tested AI with like outlines or like scripts for solo episodes or things like that, and it just like they're just things that just doesn't make sense. It can't get your personality, it can't get your things like that. Yeah, so it definitely is an interesting thing for sure. But um, yeah, I don't think I think it's a great tool. But mm-hmm. I don't see it, but of course, you know. Someone said something to me that was very disquieting. They said, there's no history, and there's no you know, precedent of something that's smarter than something I'm still being willing to, to work for that thing, even though it knows it's smarter yeah. <laughs> than that thing is, which is kind of eerie and kind of mm-hmm. scary. But you know, I, I see it as you do. I think it, it gives vast promise. For stuff yeah. like social media stuff, but so much of that stuff is just repetition, right? It's mm-hmm. just... You want to get your face in front of the client. You have five key talking points. If you can produce 30 pieces of content, that's great. Yeah. But, but it's your content. It's it's your, it's your sensibilities, Chris. It's who you are. Yeah. When you believe in it, it's, it's that thing. that And that, it can't manufacture that, that sensibility. You have to imbue the whole thing, the whole process with that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a definitely, and it's going to continue to grow. And we're going to see a lot of, a lot of things. Like we watched, I watched the video with, um zuckerberg showing his new vr is crazy obviously they spent time str- having it scan themselves and like but it was a whole vr thing it looked just like them and now yeah. you know tom hanks is coming out um and another actress coming out saying this ai deep fake stuffs uh like people were doing ads with their likeness and their voice and it wasn't them and people think it's actually tom hanks on the video he's like this is not me like this is wrong and we're gonna get in a lot of you know i know canada they're trying to um, put some more censorship on things on social media and with podcasts. Uh, Trudeau, I know is, is pushing some stuff there. It's just going to be an interesting with everything going on. Um, I, I, hadn't hear, I hadn't heard that. What's he doing? Yeah. It's some sort of, some sort of bill he's trying to pass. I just saw on valuetainment, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, Patrick, but Be- Be- David's show, mm. they shared it about him trying to pass something that's going to, unless you're, like a, a certain creator, social media, they're going to, they want to uh, hinder freedom of speech more is, is strong, but um, it was an interesting article uh, about what he's trying to pass with that. And I mean, us the stuff's here sh- weird within that space too. So it's an interesting, and it was AI coming, like how do we manage all this deep fake and things? I think what's happening here is that, the issue is news content, and the problem is that local news providers weren't like our we're just our newspaper was just getting decimated up here. So it, it, I, I I don't know if it was framed around uh, a freedom of speech question so much as they were getting Facebook was getting a lot of news that they could put on they could post on their social media and people use it as a news feed that they weren't mm-hmm. paying, right? They just weren't. They would just scoop up whatever they wanted. Mm-hmm. So the, so the, the and so what's happened is it's driven uh, independent news producers like small newspapers out of business. Like yeah. we just lost six hundred people in in this area in terms of the journalism trade. So it, it, it wasn't it wasn't sort of this uh, kind of dark. Uh, my understanding, at least, a, sort of this dark force of of crushing dissent or mm-hmm. eliminating freedom of speech, so much as this idea that these people have to get paid if they're doing this work. 
Mm. It's almost too little too late because now the people that are doing the work are out of business. Yeah. It's a, definitely an, an interesting dynamic with what we have yeah. and yeah. So it'll be interesting, but you know, kind of to get off and I brought it in that rabbit hole. That was my fault. Yeah, <laughs> but no you know, one last thing I did want to ask about writing a book. So you, you've laid out a great structure. You've given great actionable tips that people can start now, obviously yeah. reaching out to people like you to get help if, if they need it. Once that book is written, do you have tips or, you know, industry secrets that allow people to market that out in a, in a more positive way, in a, in a, in a wider way? Do you have a good structure for marketing a book? No. (laughs) (laughs) No secrets here. No secrets are coming. I am a a blank page. I am a blank page. No, because it's really, it depends upon what the the client wants to do. If they want to leverage Mm -hmm. their book or not. The secret is they now have the sort of North star to leverage that book. And, and they know now know what their content is about and what their content should be about it. They can obviously use it to leverage speeches, appearances, elevator pitches, that sort of sure. stuff. So I guess in that way it's helpful. But my job is just to get you to the, <laughs> to the starting line because 99.99% of people aren't at the starting line. Right. I get you there and I get you there with that story in tow. So you're ready to go. What you do with that kite after I hand it to you is, is depends on how hard you want to run. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. And that makes sense. Yeah, I think you have to know where you want to go before you can set the plan to get there. So, oh, yeah, I know what I know about marketing a book, you could put in the head of a pin. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I know you at least can start getting on podcasts. I know a lot of people do that. So that's a good way to get it out there. And yeah, and I just I got to tell you how much fun this has been. I so appreciate you having me on. It's been really fun. I've learned a lot. I've learned that there is actually a Kokomo, Indiana, for one thing. Yep. Yeah, and I, I always thought the song was about. Uh, our city growing up we i'd always listen to it going to florida i was like man they wrote a song about us this is cool i was like i don't know why people would want to come to kokomo for i'm leaving for vacation no one comes to kokomo so, no. No, and i have to ask it i know yeah. talking about me but how's your business going how's the podcasting working for you good it's been fantastic uh you know as this episode was being recorded we just le- released episode 295 so once this one comes out we'll be past 300 wow and uh yeah you know it's changed along the way um adapted have shifted a little bit rebranded a little bit along the way but it's continually you know grown it's brought elevate you know it's, it's what elevate was created from and and so it's been it's been really good you know been super you know blessed and humbled to be you know, in the top 2% listened to globally, uh, charted, charted, charted internationally in the top, you know, 30, the to top 25, depending on what chart you're looking at and, you know, super blessed and, um, you know, being able to share and help other people, you know, build their brands and businesses through not only what I speak on my solo episodes, but you know, what fantastic people like you might share, uh, to help them, you know, just elevate what they're doing. So, um, uh-huh. I'm wrecking your format, but I have to ask you, and yeah. this is kind of a question that sometimes people ask, uh, ask off camera. We can do that off camera. How do you get people? How do you convince people? I don't, I don't quite know what the verb is there, but how do you make the person you're speaking with understand that you care about their story and that mm. their story is important to you? And because it's important to you, it should be important to them. But because you know, we don't, the thing about human beings is we don't know what we don't know, what we think, uh, if I may, just give you an example. Yeah. When I was a little kid, my dad was kind of a crazy guy. He would take the dog for a walk, but he would put the dog in the car. He would drive the car out to a dirt road. He'd take this little dog and he'd put him outside the car and then he'd slowly drive away. <laughs> and the poor dog. <laughs> and I thought this was normal, right? Because I said, oh, my dad did, everybody did that. And this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but when I see people later on walking their dogs on a leash, I would say to myself, those poor people can't afford a car. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was my norm. Right. And so the things that are amazing in people, they think is just, you know, not interesting because it's their story. So to go circle around to you, how do you sort of convince that person that what they don't think is important is really, really important to value somebody else? Mm. That's a great question. And I think it comes back to, you know, everyone has a story. I, I truly, truly believe everyone has a story and has their experiences and their ups and downs for a reason. And I think that alone is enough to share because someone else out there can resonate or can say, yeah, I get it. 
and I've been there too, or, Hey, wow, they've, they've done, they've been through exactly what I've been through, or they deal with the same things. Uh, and I can learn from them. Uh, or, you know, like you have an expertise in writing books and, and getting people authored. And like, there are so many people out there who want to know how to do that. Um, again, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, like if we don't put it out there, we're doing the world a disservice. I so agree. The people like there's a, there's someone probably listening to this episode right now, Mike, that is going to write a book because of your episode. Uh, that they wouldn't uh, have, they wouldn't have done if we didn't have this episode. No, and that's kind of, that's kind of how I, I, I come from that direction when I'm bringing people on. I'm like, what can I learn from them? What can they teach someone else? Because I truly believe I can learn from anyone. And I want to share that with those who are listening because, you know, together we can, you know, elevate so many more people by sharing this out and, and doing all that. So. Uh, I think well, that's a great answer. Yeah. I think that's a great answer. It's a great thought, isn't it? That you, mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier uh, that uh, I wrote a book that's in every, pretty well every library, you know, so I have that tangible thing and go into a library and find it. It's a little difficult from what you're, you're talking about. But if that person has that book, you mm-hmm. know, on Amazon, whatever it is, it's the same thing. You've inspired that person to write that book and you go and go in that Amazon, the world's biggest bookstore, and find that yep. tangible token of something you help somebody else do. It's that's a that's pretty noble work. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's fun. You know, I I started specifically just interviewing because I wanted to learn and I knew if I, I wanted to learn something, someone else is probably wanting to learn the same thing. And now it's grown yeah. to, I want to continue to learn, but yeah. now I want to share what I've learned personally. And that's why I started doing solo episodes this year. And uh, yeah, I mean, however we can help more people is, is the ultimate goal and, um, you know, build something outside of what they're doing now, you know? Yeah, it's very powerful. As you you nailed it, everybody has a story. It's it's a mm-hmm. bit of a cliche, right? But, but we all do because we don't because we don't know what we don't know, right? Yep. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. And and it, that is so powerful. Yeah. So, Mike, uh, it's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed this. Oh, thank you for having me, Chris. I had such yeah. good fun. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, if you're listening to this right now uh, and you're thinking about writing a book, if you're thinking about you know getting into becoming an author and haven't done it yet, you know, reach out to Mike for sure. I get connect with him, Mike Ulmer. Um, Mike, where, where can people best connect with you if they are looking to get help? There is actually a MikeUlmer.com. So Perfect. that's probably a great place to start. Awesome. Yeah. So guys, get connected with him. Uh, take that step. Uh, I know I will down the road uh, once it's the right time for me. But yeah. And if you're listening to this and you know someone who's talked about starting a book or just w- are interested in becoming an author, share this with them. Uh, that way, again, we can, you know, extend that ripple out of helping people elevate their lives and brands. Uh, but until next time, again, Mike, thanks so much for being on well, the Media Podcast. Thank you for having me. I was thrilled to do it. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Elevate Media Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. See you in the next episode.